and being here tonight. Uh, the topic of tonight's lecture is uh, from my new book. It's called The Case for Jesus, The Biblical and Historical Evidence for Christ. And this book is something that I have been um, wanting to write for a really long time. In fact, the, 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 the genesis of the book really goes back to my days as an undergraduate at LSU and some of the things that I was learning in my courses on the Gospels and on the New Testament. And um, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, a scholar named Bart Ehrman, uh, who teaches at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, wrote a book called How Jesus Became God, in which he argues against the reliability of the Gospels and against the idea that Jesus claimed to be divine. And uh, the last year I had a sabbatical, and I thought I would devote my time to this topic because I think it's really important. I think it's important for every single person alive, really, to answer the question, who do you say that Jesus of Nazareth is? Who do you say he is? And if you are a Catholic, if you're a Christian, to also be able to say why you believe in Jesus. If someone came up to you and asked you, you know, oh, so you're a Christian, why do you believe in Jesus? What would you say to them? What would be your reasons? You know, what, what are your motives of credibility? All right. Do you believe because your father believed, or your mother believed, or your friends believed? Those are good reasons. But how would you explain your faith to them starting from square one? So what we're going to do tonight is basically uh, I'm going to give you a kind of a whirlwind tour of some of the main highlights in the book. So the book goes into a lot of different topics, and I hope that maybe we can talk about some of them later in the evening when we have a short Q&A. My, my deepest desire, of course, would be that you buy the book, you know, but that's, you know, you can do that later, too. So this will give you a highlight. Uh, and I know Father Bryce began with a prayer, but I always like to, to pray briefly, too, before I begin to help me focus. So let's just begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for the gift of the Gospels. Uh, thank you for the gift of the Scriptures. I ask that as we turn our hearts and our minds to the evidence uh, in the Gospels, to the historical questions around the Gospels, that you would send the Holy Spirit upon us. And so we pray to the Father in the words that you taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, let's begin. All right. Unless you have been under a rock for the last, I don't know, five or ten years, you probably have noticed that not everyone is a Christian. Right? And that in secular Western civilization, which is growing rapidly more and more secular, that skepticism about Jesus and the Gospels is spreading, and, and quickly spreading, right? That there are lots of people these days who will say things that you wouldn't have even necessarily heard when I was younger. I'm only 40, right? Um, things like, well, I don't believe the Gospels. Those are myths. Or, Jesus of Nazareth never existed. He was a myth, right? Or, my favorite, um, the, the lost gospels have recently been discovered that show that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. Anybody heard this before, right? Okay, yeah, you know you watch those shows that come out on the History Channel. I know you do. All right, Father Bryce will hear your confession after. But, um, okay, so you have all these documentaries and popular culture spreading questions about Christianity. In fact, a lot of those documentaries that come out every year, right around Easter, right? Right around the time that Christians are beginning to proclaim the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. A lot of those documentaries uh, often draw on scholars from major universities, and they're designed frequently to raise doubts. Who was Jesus? Is Christianity true? You know, when we come back after the commercial, the truth that will undermine, you know, Everything you thought you knew about Christ and the church. So the skepticism about Jesus and the Gospels is spreading. And <clears throat> as Christians, if you're a Christian, you need to be able to answer questions about them. 
And so what I'm going to do in this presentation right now is just raise some of the major, what I think are the more substantive questions about Jesus and the Gospels, and then try to respond to them, not by arguing for my faith or by arguing from church authority or the Pope or anything like that, but just by looking at the history itself. What is the biblical and historical evidence for Christ? And we're going to look at three topics. Number one, were the Gospels re originally anonymous? In other words, who wrote them and how do we know? Are they reliable? Number two, who did Jesus of Nazareth claim to be? Did he claim to be God? The Messiah? Or just, you know, a prophet or a rabbi or a teacher? And then finally, number three, what's the evidence for the resurrection? I mean, Christians have this pretty audacious claim that Jesus of Nazareth was not only crucified, but on the third day rose again. Why would, why would anybody believe that? And why did the first Jewish Christian believe it? And I hope that you'll see by the end of the presentation that uh, far from being fideistic, in other words, a religion that is based on blind faith without any reason whatsoever, Christianity is rooted in history. It's a historical religion that uses both faith and reason. All right, so let's dive in. When it comes to skepticism about Jesus and the Gospels, there are three ideas in particular that are out there these days that are problematic. Number one, the theory of the anonymous Gospels. I'll never forget the first time I encountered this theory. I was uh, an undergraduate at LSU. My professor came into the class and said, forget everything you thought you knew about who wrote the Gospels. I know your Gospels and your Bible say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but scholars today know that the Gospels were originally anonymous. That we don't know who wrote them, and that all we do know is that they weren't written by eyewitnesses to Jesus. Right? They weren't written by actual disciples of Jesus. That's the theory of the anonymous Gospels. This theory is often coupled, number two, with another idea, uh, which is uh, commonly referred to as the telephone game theory. Anybody ever played the telephone game as a kid? Right? You get together in a party, you sit around in a circle, one person tells a story to another person who tells it to another person who tells it to another person, and then by the time you get around to the end of the circle, what's happened to the story? Yeah, it's totally distorted, it's totally changed, right? So some scholars, like Bart Ehrman I mentioned earlier, will say that the stories in the Gospels are not only communicated to us by anonymous authors, they're also like the end product of an ancient game of telephone. In other words, the stories about Jesus in the Gospels were transmitted from person to person after decade and decade over time and space across the Roman Empire until finally sometime at the end of the first century AD, between 70 and 95 AD, so you know, 40 to 60 years after Jesus died, they were finally written down in the Gospels that we have them today by people whose identity remains lost to us. Right? That's the second idea. Now, if that's the case, how does that change the way you read the Gospels? If the Gospels are the end product of an ancient game of telephone, then how much credibility are you going to give to them? Not much, right? So that's another widespread idea that's out there these days, generating skepticism toward the Gospels. The third one, though, that I really want to focus on the most is this one. And this is the one that really shook me when I was a student and I first encountered it. Uh, according to scholars who will often hold these theories that the Gospels are anonymous and they're like the end product of telephone game, Jesus of Nazareth, the actual historical figure, never actually claimed to be God. According to this theory, if you look at the Gospels carefully, Jesus only claims to be divine in the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel. He's only divine in John, and he's not divine in the first three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So if you look at John's Gospel, for example, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. John 10. Or in John 8, he says, before Abraham was, I am. Right? So he existed before Abraham, and he takes the divine name of the Old Testament God, I am. So he clearly claims to be divine in John. But some scholars will say, but that's only in John. If you look at the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus never claims to be God. He's just a human Messiah. Right? Now, if that's true, that's an important point, isn't it? Because the score then would be three Gospels with a human Jesus and only one Gospel with a divine Jesus. And which one do you think is more historical if the three earlier Gospels have a merely human and the later Gospel has a divine? Well, obviously it's going to be the three earlier Gospels. Okay. So these kind of ideas have led lots of scholars, and not just scholars, but also other people who are having access to these scholarly conclusions, to basically doubt the fundamental tenets of Christianity that the Gospels are reliable, 
and that Jesus claimed to be God. Okay. I think all three of these are wrong, and I want to tell you why. So let's walk through my research and the evidence that I present in the book, The Case for Jesus. And I'll try to tell you why all three of those opinions, which by the way, I, I held myself for years. As a doctoral student, when I was a doctoral student, I thought all, all three of these were correct. But the more I researched and the more I studied, the more I came to realize that they were all bad history. Okay? So I'm not, a t I'm not critiquing here anything I didn't myself once believe. We can talk about that later if you want, after the break. So let's look at why I think they're wrong. Let's begin with the question first of the an an anonymity of the Gospels. Were the Gospels really anonymous? Well, how do you tell who wrote a book? Right? There are basically two ways to tell who wrote any book, an ancient book or a modern book. You have two kinds of evidence, internal evidence and external evidence, right? So, for example, who wrote this book that I'm holding up here? Well, I don't know. Let's look inside or look on the cover. You see the internal evidence. It says Brant Petrie, right? That's a reasonable uh, justification for thinking that Brant Petrie wrote the book, right? However, as you know, books can be forged, can't they? They can be falsely attributed to someone. So when there's a question of doubt about who wrote a book, you don't want to just look at internal evidence from the book itself. You want to look at external evidence. In other words, you can ask people who lived at the time of the author or people who knew the author, who were rough contemporaries, hey, did Brant Petrie write a book? Right? Like you could ask my wife, did Brant write a book? And she would tell you, yes, and it caused her many headaches. Trust me, okay? Or like with Pope Benedict. You know, once Pope Benedict dies, you could ask his contemporaries, did he write a book on Jesus? And you could say, they could tell you, yes, he did. That's external evidence. It corroborates the data in the text itself. The same thing's true about ancient documents. So we want to ask, were the Gospels originally anonymous? Who wrote them? We need to look at both kinds of evidence, the internal evidence and the external evidence. And so we have to go back to the manuscripts. Because the evidence of the Gospels goes, uh, is contained in ancient Greek manuscripts, handwritten copies of the books. And as a doctoral student at Notre Dame, when I was first learning Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and all the languages you had to get to get a biblical degree, I began to wonder about this. I wonder where all the anonymous manuscripts are. So I started to research it. And guess what? I found out there are no anonymous manuscripts. Right? So the first problem with the theory of the anonymous gospels is there are no anonymous copies. If you look here at the handout point one there, when it comes to internal evidence, there are several big problems with the theory of the anonymous gospel. Number one, A, first, no anonymous manuscripts of the gospels exist. Not one. Even though we have hundreds, hundreds of ancient copies of the gospels in Greek, all of them have titles and all of them are unanimous in attributing them to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. First problem. Second problem. If you really look at it carefully, the theory that the Gospels were originally anonymous is actually kind of incredible. Because what the theory purports to claim is that what originally happened was the Gospels were written without any titles. And then according to some scholars, they circulated without titles for a hundred years throughout the empire. Before the titles were finally added to the Gospels at the end of the second century AD in order to give the books authority. That's what Bart Ehrman claims, for example. So these books supposedly circulated without any titles for a hundred years, and then at the end of the second century, the titles were added. Now the problem with that is, if that were the case, then we would expect to find a couple of things. First, you would expect to find some anonymous copies, right? Secondly, you would also expect to find that the Gospels would get attributed to different people. In other words, you'd have conflicting testimonies about who wrote this particular book. Last, and certainly not least, if that were really what happened, how is it possible that at the end of the second century, after a hundred years of circulating without any titles, all of the scribes in Africa and Asia Minor and Gaul, throughout the Roman Empire, how would they all know to ascribe the books to exactly the same people? You see what I mean? Like, how would they simultaneously know to ascribe them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John independent of one another? I mean, that would take almost a miracle for that to happen. And yet, that's what scholars and skeptics who say that the Gospels are really anonymous expect you to believe. And they expect you to believe that it not only happened with one book, but that it happened with four books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, over and over and over again throughout the empire. It's impossible. It doesn't make any sense. 
The best explanation for the fact that the gospel evidence is unanimous is that the titles go back to the originals. You follow what I'm getting at here? Okay. And in fact, that's the case. As I began to study the Greek manuscripts, point two here, I, I discovered that all of the Greek manuscripts we possess, every single one of them, are totally unanimous in attributing the four gospels to, wait for it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I know, it's shocking, right? All right, so let's look at each one of these. First, the, the first gospel is unanimously attributed to Matthias in Greek, a.k.a. Matthew the tax collector, one of the twelve apostles. The second gospel is unanimously attributed to Marcus, a.k.a. Mark, the companion of Paul and the scribe of Peter. Uh, the third gospel is unanimously attributed to Lucas, uh, in Greek, uh, also known as Luke, the Gentile physician and the companion of Paul. And then finally, the fourth gospel, my favorite, is attributed unanimously, every single manuscript, to Ioannes, John, the, also known as the beloved disciple of fisherman who was one of the twelve apostles. Now, these four men to whom the Gospels are attributed are themselves significant because they show, once again, the problem of the theory of the anonymous Gospels. Two of those men, Mark and Luke, are not eyewitnesses. They're not eyewitnesses to Jesus. Mark was a disciple of Peter. Luke was a disciple of Paul. None of them, as far as we know, ever met Jesus during his earthly life. Now, if the Gospels were originally anonymous and you wanted to falsely attribute them to people in order to give them authority, then why in the world would you pick Mark and Luke? Why? If you're going to falsely attribute this book to someone, why not say, hey, this is the Gospel of Andrew or, or uh, the Gospel of Thomas, right? Or for that matter, why not just go straight to the top and say, hey, my Gospel was written by Jesus. The gospel of Jesus Christ himself. I mean, wouldn't that be the way to give it authority? So why are these books not attributed to eyewitnesses? It's because they're not falsely attributed. They were written by Mark and by Luke. Shocking. Right? Well, what about the other gospels? Well, sometimes scholars will say, well, we know that Matthew and John couldn't have written the gospels attributed to them because Jesus' disciples were a bunch of illiterate fishermen. That's one of the things Ehrman says. Uh, Ehrman writes, he says, even if the disciples of Jesus and eyewitnesses wanted to write a gospel, they couldn't have done it because they were illiterate. And in fact, the Acts of the Apostles says that Peter and John were agramatos, illiterate men. They were fishermen. Right? Well, what's the problem with that argument? Well, not every one of Jesus' apostles was a fisherman. Yes, Peter, Andrew, James, and John are fishermen. But that's only four of the twelve. There's a fifth apostle. His name is Matthew. And guess what he did for a living? He was an IRS agent, right? <laughs> the ancient equivalent. So he was a tax collector. Now, what might you have to do if you're a tax collector? Anyone? Write what? Documents in both Greek and in Hebrew, because he's working for the Roman government, but he's drawing taxes from the Jews, right? So what a coincidence. So you've got Matthew, the tax collector. Now imagine you're all sitting around and you're listening to this Jesus guy talk. And you're like, man, he is good. These are, these are some fantastic lectures. And you can't record them on your iMac, right? So what are you going to do? You've got to take notes, right? So let's see, who might take notes? Fisherman, 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 tax collector. There's your guy, right? Because he's literate. He's got scribal literacy skills. So it's actually plausible that Matthew is the one who was the first to write an account of Jesus' life. Right? And by the way, even John, although he's called illiterate, it is true, uh, could have composed his gospel in the way that people to this day compose the gospel. I mean, not the gospels. Compose writings if, they, if they're not literate or they don't like to write themselves. What do you do? You get a secretary. And you dictate it, Right? I mean, John may have been a fisherman, he wasn't stupid, right? If he wanted to compose a gospel, he could dictate it to someone. And in fact, his gospel reads as if it was orally dictated. So anyway, all that to say, if you look at the internal evidence, just from the text themselves, it's very plausible, in fact, it's all unanimous, that the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were actually written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right. Now... You might say, okay, well, Dr. Petrie, that's fine, but what about the question of forgery, right? 
And so I would say that's a good point. So we want to also look at external evidence. And this is what many skeptics don't ever do. So we want to go look at ancient Christian writings outside the Bible called the early church fathers and say and see what they had to say about who wrote these books. I'll never forget the first time I started reading the church fathers. I didn't even know there were writings outside the New Testament uh, when I was an undergraduate before I really started digging in. And I was shocked because I expected the earliest Christian writers outside the New Testament from the 2nd century and 3rd century, I expected them to be as you know, vague and in the dark about who wrote the Gospels as my teachers had been, as my professors had been. Right? I expected them to say, oh, well, they were anonymous, but we think they were written by these other people. But when I started reading the Fathers, and I have a whole chapter on them in the book, I found out that every single one of these men who were taught by the Apostles or who were taught by men who knew the Apostles, they are completely unanimous. No doubts, no lack of clarity whatsoever that the Gospels were written by Matthew and John and Mark and Luke. So I'll give you just one example here. This is from St. Irenaeus of Lyon. He lives in the 2nd century AD, around 180. He was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of St. John himself. Right? And this is what he says. Quote, Matthew also issued a written Gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect, while Peter and Paul were preaching in Rome. And after the departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. Luke also, the companion of Paul, recorded in a book the gospel preached by him. And afterwards, John, the disciple of the Lord, who had also leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during his residence in Ephesus in Asia. End of quote. Does he seem to be in doubt about who wrote these books? No. This is external evidence for the fact that the Gospels were written by eyewitnesses or disciples of apostles. Okay, so the internal and evidence, external evidence agrees. And there's zero evidence to the contrary. Now you might say, okay, well, Dr. Petrie, that's fine. But what about those lost Gospels? I mean, you're just talking about the four Gospels in the New Testament. What about all these other Gospels I hear about every year, like the Gospel of Thomas, or the Gospel of Judas, or the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, right? I mean, aren't those other Gospels credible then too? And the answer is no. Because although those other Gospels contain internal evidence attributing them to Thomas, or Mary Magdalene, or uh, Judas, although... Is he really your guy? Like, you want to write a gospel? And you want Judas to be like your patron saint? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, whatever. Okay, so yes, they attributed them to the apostles. But the interesting thing is when you look at the external evidence from the church fathers, guess how the ancient Christians reacted to all those gospels? Said that they, were, they said unanimously that they were forgeries and fakes. And in fact, even skeptical scholars admit the Gospels of Judas and Thomas and uh, Mary Magdalene, that they, didn't, they weren't even published, they weren't even written until the late 2nd century A.D., which would be over 100 years after all of the apostles were dead, including Judas, right? And it's really hard to write a book when you're dead. <laughs> Seriously, like, try it sometime, okay? In other words, by definition, these 2nd and 3rd century writings are forgeries and fakes, and they were recognized as such by the early Christians. But I thought I'd give you a little taste of one of my favorite uh, chapters from, from one of these Gospels. So let's just look at an example. I have a whole chapter in the book on the lost Gospels, but this is just an example. Uh, this is from the infancy Gospel of Thomas, and it tells the story about Jesus when he was a little boy. Ever wonder what Jesus was like when he was little? Well, try this on for size. When this boy Jesus was five years old, he gathered together into pools the water that flowed by, and he made it at once clean. But the son of Annas the scribe was standing there, and he took a branch of the willow and dispersed the water that Jesus had gathered together. Now when Jesus saw what he had done, he was enraged, and he said to him, You insolent, godless dunderhead! What harm did the pools in the water do to you? See, now you shall also wither like a tree. And immediately the lad withered up completely. After this, Jesus again went through the village, and a lad ran and knocked against his shoulder. Jesus was exasperated and said to him, You shall not go further on your way. And the child immediately fell down and died. <laughs> Whoa. Stay away from Jesus on the playground, right? I mean, this, this kid's in terror. Right? These are the kind of stories you find in the apocryphal gospels. These lost, They're bizarre. They're strange. And in this case, actually, I really wonder whether this was even written by a Christian. I think this was probably written by somebody mocking 
Jesus. I'll be frank with you with regard to this one. Others were written by heretics who were, had a very distorted view of Christianity. In, other, in any case, the contents of the Gospels raise suspicions about these lost Gospels, and then the external evidence is unanimous in rejecting them as fakes, as forgeries. All right, so you might say, okay, well, Dr. Petrie, that's fine. Maybe the Gospels are written by apostles and eyewitnesses, but how do we know that they're actually telling us the truth about Jesus? In other words, how do we know that they're not just a game of telephone, right? Maybe they're trying to tell stories about Jesus that were just meant to make, you know, like a moral point, like a kind of oral tradition or a folk tale, right? And I would answer you by saying, well, let's listen to what the authors of the Gospels tell us themselves about what they're doing. Do they describe their intentions as a literary work to be historical in character? Or are they just telling fairy tales and folklore? And the answer can be found in two of the Gospels. Are the Gospels historical biographies? Well, look at how they describe themselves. I'll give you just a brief quote here from the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John. And I want you to read these. You've probably heard them before. But read these with the, with the idea in mind that... Uh, the Gospels are really like a children's game of telephone. That they're more like folklore. Keep that idea in mind and then read this and tell me if that jives with what they say they're doing. Luke begins his Gospel as follows, quote, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as they were delivered to us by those who from the beginning were, what? Eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. That's the patron of the book, his audience. That you may know what? The truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. Luke 1, 1 to 4. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Luke which is the third gospel, and again, as I pointed out, which is attributed to someone who wasn't actually himself a disciple of Jesus. Make sure that you know from the very first chapter of his book that everything he's about to say about what Jesus did and what Jesus said, everything he's about to say about the events that have happened among us, is based on the testimony of autoptai in Greek. We get the word autopsy from that. Autoptai means eyewitnesses. They saw it for themselves. Right? So why is he interested in telling you that? Is that how your fairy tales begin? Once upon a time there was an eyewitness. No, no it doesn't work that way. Right? You only make a, have recourse to eyewitnesses because you want to testify to the veracity right, of what you're about to present. Okay? And because he wasn't an eyewitness, he wants to make sure you know that he got it from eyewitnesses. Which, by the way, eyewitnesses from the beginning, where does Luke begin his gospel? With the story of Mary and the Annunciation. Who lived in Ephesus, which is where Luke traveled with Paul during one of his journeys. Now imagine you're writing a biography of Jesus and his mama lives down the street. Do you think you might interview her? I mean, just, you know, possibly, right? That's a very plausible thing, to, right? Same thing's true here. All right, what about John? Another quote. This is how John's gospel ends. After a little story of Peter and the beloved disciple uh, with Jesus, uh, and he highlights the beloved disciple, the book ends by saying, This is the disciple, meaning the beloved disciple, who is bearing witness to these things, and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things which Jesus did, were every one of them to be written. I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Although, I am trying to fill it up. So I, I, got, I, got, I got three books here. I got a few more back there. Um, okay, wait, don't turn a page. I didn't tell you to turn a page. Hold on, back up. Back up. Look at the passage. Notice what he said. His testimony is true. In a Jewish context, the word testimony means formal public witness. Like you bear, you, you give, where do you give testimony? In a, a courtroom, right? So this is a formal public witness to the truth of what Jesus did and said. That's not the same thing as a, as a, as a fairy tale or a myth or even just as tradition, like, you know, oral tradition. He's bearing witness. And in Judaism, you remember one of the commandments, what was it? You shall not bear false 
witness, right? So you got to remember, this is a Jewish disciple here. For him to lie about what Jesus did is a grave violation of the Torah, of the law. So he's emphatically, um, emphatically proclaiming here and insisting that what he's just given you in his gospel, although it's not complete, you know, he's, I didn't tell you everything Jesus did. So it's incomplete, but it's true. You see the, you see the point? Does that sound like a fairy tale? Does that sound like the children's game of telephone to you? That analogy for the Gospels really gets under my skin. It is academically irresponsible, in my opinion, to compare the Gospel stories to the end product of a children's game of telephone. The only reason you would ever do that as a scholar is to undermine people's confidence in the books. It's that simple. There's no historical grounds for such an analogy. It's baseless. You want an analogy with the Gospels? Go start reading ancient biographies. That's what they are. All right, and I've got a whole chapter on that, too, in the book. But we've got to move on. Okay, so, now I'll turn the page. Okay, so presuming, for the sake of argument, that, Jesus, that the Gospels are written by eyewitnesses or disciples of eyewitnesses, and that they are historical biographies that are purporting to tell us what Jesus actually did and what Jesus actually said, now we come to the next question. Who did Jesus of Nazareth claim to be? And in particular, did Jesus claim to be God? Because that's really the, the heart of the Christian claim, right? Not just that he's the Messiah, the King of Israel, but that he is God, made man. The Incarnation. Now, if you look at the three earlier Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you read through them very quickly and try to find the place where Jesus says, Hey, everybody, I'm God. You're not going to find it. That's true. Jesus never comes out and explicitly says in the Gospels, I am God. And so some people will say, Ah, see? See? He did not claim to be anything more than an earthly messiah. And that works for some people. They find it compelling because they're taking his words out of context. So one of the main burdens of my book was to do what I, I love to do. I love to go back and look at the Jewish roots of Catholicism, the Jewish roots of Christianity, and try to show you how the Old Testament background is what lights up the New Testament. And the same thing's true about the Eucharist. I'm sorry, the Eucharist. I can't help talking about the Eucharist. Okay. It's true about the Eucharist. It's true about um, the passion of Christ. And the same thing's true about the divinity of Jesus as well. Yes, on the one hand, it is true. Jesus never went around town shouting in the streets, Hey, everybody, I'm God. I'm the second person of the Trinity. But he did claim to be divine. He just did it in a Jewish way for a Jewish audience using language from the Jewish scriptures, and also, and this is really important, using parables and riddles and questions. Right? Jesus did not go around shoving his divinity down people's throats. He instead taught about his divinity in a very powerful way. He used parables and riddles and questions in the Bible, the language of the Bible, watch this, to both reveal his divinity to those who had faith and to conceal it from his enemies who would attack him and try to put him to death if he were more explicit about it. Do you understand what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. You've read the Gospels. What happens when the demons say, hey, you're the son of God? What does Jesus say? Shh. Cool it, you know? And then people will cry out, I know who you are. You're the one, son of David. Shh. Don't tell anybody. It's called the Messianic Secret. Have you ever wondered why he does that? It's a little odd, no? Right? Why wouldn't he want everyone to go out and say it? Well, because he has a public ministry to engage in. He's got a kingdom to reveal. And the second, if he were just to go around shouting, Hey, everybody, I'm God, he would immediately be charged with blasphemy. Okay? So what he's going to do is he's going to use riddles and questions to lead people into the mystery. So let me give you a couple of examples of this. And I'm just using the Synoptic Gospels now. I'm just using the earlier ones, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'm not going to use John, just the first three. All right, so there are two things, first point, top of page two, that Jesus always talks about in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The kingdom of God and the Son of Man. The kingdom of God and the Son of Man. I mean, you know the Gospels. He, he, this is his two favorite expressions. Well, what did they mean in context as a first century Jew? Well, when we hear kingdom of God, we think heaven, 
And when we hear son of man, we think he's just simply emphasizing his humanity, right? And, and those are both partially correct. But in a first century Jewish context, this was a very specific terminology that Jesus was alluding to a particular book of the Old Testament. You go back to the Old Testament, you don't see this mysterious use of the Son of Man and the Kingdom of God anywhere except one book, the book of Daniel. He's kind of Jesus' favorite prophet. He's always alluding to Daniel, right? So in Daniel's book, he has a vision of the Son of Man and the Kingdom of, of, of God or the Kingdom of Heaven. Let's look at that. Now, this is a long vision. I go through it in detail in the book. For now, I'm just going to sum up the climax of the vision here. Top of page two. It says this. I, Daniel, saw in my vision by night four great beasts came up out of the sea. And behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a what? Son of man. There it is. And to him, meaning the son of man, was given dominion and glory and kingdom so that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. You can actually translate, should worship him. You can do it either way. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Daniel chapter 7. All right, this is a very important passage. Very important passage. What's going on in this passage? Well, I've just given you a little chart here to kind of break it down for you. In essence, Daniel here, watch this. He has a vision of when the Messiah and the kingdom of God are going to come. All right? And this vision consists of a sequence of symbolic beasts that represent the different kingdoms of the ancient world. So if you look at your chart, look at that first column on the left-hand side. Basically, what Daniel sees is a vision of a sequence of these five uh, images. First, the lion, then the bear, then the leopard then the fourth beast, and then the fourth beast, at the time of the fourth beast, comes the Son of Man. Right? And Daniel asks the angel, well, what do these mean? And so the angel interprets each one of them for him. If you look at the second column, the angel's interpretation, actually you can look at both those, is that each of these represents a king and a kingdom. Right? So the first king, the lion, represents the Babylonian Empire, who you remember destroyed the temple of the Jews in the 6th century B.C. The second beast, the bear, represents a second king of the Medo-Persian Empire, who also overtook Babylon and then overtook the Jews. The third king, the leopard, represents the kingdom of Greece, which spread very quickly under Alexander the Great throughout the ancient world in the 4th century BC. And then the fourth beast was a fourth king, right? a terrible beast, representing the power of the Roman Empire that came in the 1st century BC, and was still reigning over the Jews by the time of Jesus in the first century A.D., right? He's around 30 A.D. So what Daniel, in his essence, is seeing here is that there's going to be a fifth and final king, a fifth and final kingdom, and this king will be this one like a son of man who very mysteriously comes on the clouds of heaven, is seated on the throne in heaven, and then receives this everlasting kingdom, which unlike the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans, this kingdom is never, ever going to end. Now what's mysterious about the Son of Man is that any Jew would have known that in the Old Testament, all the other books of the Old Testament, the only person who comes on the clouds is God. Yahweh himself. The angels don't come in the clouds. The kings don't come in the clouds. Only Yahweh comes on the clouds. Only God comes in the clouds. And yet this son of man comes on the clouds, right? Some scholars, in fact, even Jewish scholars. So I'm going to quote one here. Daniel Boyar, and he teaches, he's a rabbi. He teaches at Yale. He used to teach at Yale. I don't, and that was in the 90s. I'm not sure where he is now. But he actually says this. So you don't have to take my word for it. Listen to what he writes. What this text, Daniel 7, projects is a second divine figure. And he's a Jew, the monotheist, right? This is a second divine figure, a God who looks like a human being, who is now called Son of Man. So fast forward to the life of Jesus. He comes onto the scene, starts saying, repent, the kingdom is at hand, the time is fulfilled. What time? The time from the book of Daniel. And he starts referring to himself over and over again in the third person as the Son of Man. The Son of Man. The Son of Man. Why is he doing that? Because he's revealing to those who have the ears to hear 
that he is the Messiah of Daniel's prophecy. And that he's not just an earthly Messiah, he is what? A heavenly being who has come down to earth. Right? So he's both human and divine. You follow? Does that make sense? But can he get arrested for calling himself that? A son of man. No, it's going to be too ambiguous. Like the, he, he called himself a son of man. Well, of course he's a son of man. He's human, right? See, it has a double meaning. So it's the context that's going to give the, the, the thrust to it, the divine implications. All right, so that's just one example. Let's look at some other reasons. It's one thing to claim to be a son of man or to be divine. It's another thing to prove it through miracles, right? Uh, and this is one of the things that the skeptics, uh, who will often say that Jesus of Nazareth wasn't divine, what they invariably do, and Ehrman does this as well in his book, is ignore the miracles of Jesus. They ignore them as if they didn't exist. Even though, I mean, think about it. Pretend you're God, right? Just for a second, though, because it's blasphemy to do it for too much longer. But pretend you're God. Now, you're going to come down to earth, and you want people to believe in your divinity. Are, is all you're going to do, uh, are, are you just going to tell people, hey, I'm divine, trust me. Trust me, you know? Or will you give them motives for believing it? In other words, will you give them some signs, some reason to believe you? Well, yeah. So Jesus is going to perform certain miracles that point to the fact that he's more than just an ordinary human being. And one of the most powerful ones of these is uh, one of my favorite scenes, the walking on the water, when Jesus walks on the sea. So you know this story, but let's go back and read it and try to hear it in a Jewish key, like through Jewish eyes. All right, Mark chapter 6. This is still the early Synoptic Gospels. We read, About the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. Now he meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost. So, by the way, the disciples believed in ghosts. There it is right there. And they cried out, for they all saw him and they were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and he said, Take heart, literally, I am. Ego a me in the Greek. Take heart, I am. Have no fear. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded. So what just happened here? Well, you might be tempted to think that, well, this is just a miracle. You know, Jesus kind of showing his divine power. And that's true, but something more is going on here in a Jewish context. Because of two elements of the text. First... When Jesus says, I am, that's significant. On the one hand, you could think, well, that just means it's me. And some translations actually make that the translation. They just say, it is I. But that's not what it says. It says, I am. And the reason that's important is because in the Old Testament, those are the exact words of Yahweh when he reveals himself to Moses on Mount Sinai. In other words, I am is the name of the Jewish God. Look at the story here. God reveals his name to Moses, I am. When Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, he says to God, quote, if I, th this is when he's, uh, context, sorry, when he's in front of the burning bush. You know the story of the burning bush, right? And it burns, but it's not consumed. And so Moses says to God, if I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, well, what's his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. In other words, I am he who is. I don't have any beginning. I don't have any end. I simply am. In other words, as St. Thomas would later say, God is being itself. He's not a being. He is being itself. I am. Ego in me. That's his name. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. That's his name for all generations. So Jesus appears to the apostles and he says, don't be afraid, I am. Now in context, he's not just identifying himself. What's he doing? He's revealing his divine nature. Some of the critics of my book will say, well, in other contexts, I am just simply means it's me. He's not necessarily saying he's divine here. And I'm like, well, yes, that's true. I am can be used to mean it's me. But let's look at the context. What is the context? 
He's walking on water, right? Let's keep that in mind here, right? You know, there's a context here, okay? So he's in the midst of performing this miracle, right? It's, I'm sorry. It's just frustrating sometimes when people take things out of context, right? I never said the words I am alone mean he's divine. I said the words in context mean he's divine. And if you have any doubts about that, just look at the next note. Mark says, in literally in the Greek, he intended to pass them by. It's weird, huh? Like, what's he, he's going to 7-Eleven, get something, it's the middle of the night, he's having a craving. I mean, what, where's he going? Right. Well, this is technical terminology. In the Greek, parerkamai, the language of passing by, is what God does when he appears to human beings. So if you go back to the Old Testament, that's what God does with Moses and Elijah when he's on Mount Sinai. So uh, two theophanies, appearances of God in the Old Testament. The first one is to Moses. Look, what, look, what, look how it happens. Imagine you're a Jew and you know these scriptures. You hear them all the time in the synagogue. The Lord said to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, Yahweh, right? He who is. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock. I will cover you with my hand until I've done what? Pass by. Same thing. Next passage. God said to Elijah. Remember when he's up on the mountain and he used the thunder and the lightning and the still small voice? He has this theophany. God said to Elijah, go forth, stand upon the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord did what? He passed by. What a coincidence that Jesus passes by and uses the divine name in the context of walking on the water. You think that's a coincidence? I, I don't think so. I think this is a Jewish way of revealing that he's no ordinary man. He's not just the Messiah. He is the God who appeared to Moses and Elijah, now come in the flesh. That's the point of the revelation. And if you have any doubts about that, in Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 14, guess how the apostles respond? Well, first Peter tries to get out on the water and then he kind of sinks, but he, he does okay, at least for a second. Once he gets back in the boat, it says in Matthew's gospel, and they all said to him, truly you're the son of God, and they worshiped him. And it doesn't say Jesus said, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. You got me all wrong. I'm just a man. I'm just a prophet. I'm just a rabbi. No, he accepts that worship that we do only to God alone. So, second point then. If, if, uh, if it comes to, when it comes to the walking on the sea, Jesus is clearly revealing his divinity. Now, you may be thinking at this point, hey, I don't think any of that happened. Well, that's fine. If you don't want to believe that that happened, that's one thing. But don't go around telling me that the synoptic gospels don't have a divine Jesus. Follow what I'm getting at? He's divine in Matthew, he's divine in Mark, he's divine in Luke, and he's divine in John, which means he's divine in all four biographies of Christ. So the onus is on you to tell me why I should accept their firsthand testimony. And we could talk about that maybe in the Q&A. <clears throat> oh, one last point too. Sometimes people will say, uh, about the walking in the sea, sometimes people will say, well, you know, did Jesus really know he was God? You know, you, you hear this right now. Well, I like to point this out. I used to live in Covington. Everybody know where Covington is on the North Shore Lake Ponce train? And I would commute into the city because I teach at Notre Dame in downtown New Orleans and uh, uptown, whatever it is, old town. I don't know. I'm not from there. Um, <laughs> somewhere in the town. Anyway, uh, so I commute into the city and on the causeway they had those mile markers. You know, it's a 24 mile long bridge, longest bridge in the world. Uh, and in John's gospel, it actually adds a detail. It tells us that the, that the boat was four miles from the shore. So one day I was driving to work. I was like, huh, I wonder how far that is from the shore. So when I got to mile marker four, you know, I kind of quickly looked back to see how far away the shore was. Four miles is a long way, right? So I like to tell my students, look, if Jesus didn't know he was divine by mile one, I bet he figured it out by mile four, you know? <laughs> Something's different about me. I'm not like all the other kids, you know what I mean? <laughs> Let's just try to be reasonable here, right? All right, context, you know, context. But in all seriousness, meditate on that for a little bit. Try to meditate on it, take time, pray about that. Think about, it. put yourself in Jesus' shoes, walking on the sea, four miles at night in a storm. Like, he has power over the wind and the waves. He's the guy who made the wind and the waves. That's the whole point. 
All right, final point about uh, divinity of Jesus at the bottom of page two. What about the trial? <clears throat> well, sometimes skeptics will say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God, and we don't have any evidence that he ever explicitly claimed to be God. Like, yeah, your messianic secret thing, that's, that's, a, you know, that's a helpful, evasive maneuver. Well, the, the fact is, no, he does explicitly claim to be divine uh, at the end of his public ministry, even in the synoptics, when he comes before the Sanhedrin at his trial. Right? So you remember in the count of the trial, they were trying to trump up these charges against him, like that he was going to destroy the temple in three days and raise it up again. But they couldn't get the witnesses to agree. So they can't get him on any charges of working against the temple. So finally, the high priest Caiaphas just gets fed up and asks him point blank, who are you? And this is what the gospel says. The high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Christ there just means Messiah. Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see who? The Son of Man, seated at the right hand of power, that means the right hand of God, coming with the clouds of heaven. And what does the high priest do? He just tears his garments. The high priest tore his garments and said, why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. Don't turn the page. Okay. Hold on. I know you like to turn them pages, but watch. Look what happened here. Hear me now. This is very important. Christians sometimes assume falsely that it was blasphemy to claim to be the Messiah. It wasn't. The Messiah was just the king of Israel. You know, like David or Saul or Solomon. It's not blasphemy to claim to be the king. How else are you supposed to know who the king is? So, when Caiaphas charges Jesus with blasphemy, it can't just be his messianic claim. He has to be claiming something more. He has to be claiming to be divine son of God. In other words, it wasn't blasphemy to claim to be the Messiah, but it was blasphemy to claim to be God. To claim to be divine. To claim to sit on God's throne. If you sit on a king's throne, guess what? You're equal in authority to the king, right? And you sit on God's throne, you're equal with God. And therein lies the blasphemy. So they don't need any more witnesses, because the capital case required two people, but they've all heard him, and now they can condemn him to death. And that's why he was condemned to death. He was condemned to death for who he claimed to be. It's that simple. All right? Now turn the page. All right. Well, um, there's so much more we could say here, but uh, I say it all in the book. No, if you want the book, you can get that. Um, I will make one quick last point that I found cool. It's one of the cool things I discovered while I was writing the book. It has to do with the timeline for Daniel uh, and the prophecy of Daniel. If you look at the top of page three, just very briefly, there's, this isn't the only passage in the book of Daniel that's significant, uh, you know, the kingdom of God. There's another prophecy in Daniel 9 about the coming of the Messiah and the fact that he would be killed. Because one of the things that sometimes people get tripped up is by the crucifixion. Like, okay, if Jesus is God, why does he end up dead on the cross? That's a good question. Right? Even more, why does he say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a strange thing for God to say. I'm not going to answer that now. I'll do it in the book. Um, or we can talk about it after. But I would highlight one other element that Christians are often unaware of. And it's this. that The, the Old Testament does say the Messiah will be killed in one passage in the book of Daniel. The only explicit prophecy that mentions Messiah. And if you look at the top of page 3, basically in Daniel chapter 9, he gives a prophecy that consists of four main elements, left-hand column. <clears throat> Number one, that a word is going to go forth to restore Jerusalem. Number two, that there will be 70 weeks of years after that happens. And number three, during that period, the Messiah will be cut off, which means killed. And in the wake of his death, quote, number four, the city and the sanctuary, meaning Jerusalem and the temple, will be destroyed. Now, the remarkable thing about this prophecy in Daniel 9 is that if you look at the next two columns there, that it can be correlated with historical events that actually took place, right? Around 457 BC, King Artaxerxes of Persia put out a decree to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. 
And if you take that decree and you go forward 70 weeks of years, as Daniel puts it, or 490 years, 70 times 7 years, you go from the 5th century, plop into the beginning of the 1st century A.D., right around A.D. 33. Anything interesting that happened in A.D. 33? Yes. Okay. It's the public ministry of Christ and his death on the cross. And what happens after Jesus dies? 40, in 40 years, the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed and it, and it hasn't been rebuilt since. And N.T. Wright, a famous Anglican scholar, points out that the, one of the reasons Jews loved the book of Daniel is because he didn't just t- say that the Messiah would come. He told when it would happen. And it was in the first century A.D. So Jesus doesn't just say he's the Messiah. He fulfills the timeline of the Old Testament itself. Now we're moving beyond, I think, the realm of coincidence to the realm of divine providence. Okay, well, one last uh, question then. So we've got the Gospels or eyewitness biographies or written by people who knew eyewitnesses that are biographies in character and historical in character. In those biographies, in every one of them, the earliest ones as well as the later ones, Jesus not only claims to be the Messiah, he claims to be divine in a Jewish way, and he gets executed for who he claims to be. And then number three... In all of those accounts, he also is said to have been raised from the dead. Okay, so the resurrection is the final issue. All right, if Jesus claimed to be divine and he was crucified, then why should I believe in a crucified Messiah? Can we vindicate his message? And the resurrection functions in precisely that way. But the question we should all have is, why would you believe in the resurrection? That's an odd thing to believe in, don't you think? I mean, the Christians went around proclaiming, this is important, they didn't go around saying, Jesus' soul went into heaven. He's with the Lord now, you know. That's not, he appeared to me in a dream. No, no, no. It's not that he is a disembodied spirit. It's that his soul and his body have been reunited. So he's come back to bodily life. That's what the resurrection means. And he did it on the third day. So why did anyone believe that had happened? It's an important question to ask. Sometimes as Christians, if you grew up Christian, you might just assume the resurrection. But it's really important to ask that question, why believe in it? And sometimes people will say, especially skeptics, they'll say, well, you know, ancient people. They're primitive. They're not as smart as us. They don't have cell phones. They don't have computers. Right? So they were just credulous people. They'd believe anything. Well, no, that's not true. If you actually spend any time off your cell phone reading ancient books, you will find that ancient people, if anything, were smarter than us, right? And that the ancient people in the Gospels, the disciples, every single one of them, every account of the Gospels, the first reaction to the resurrection of Jesus is doubt. Peter doubts. The apostles doubt when the women come back with the tomb. Mary Magdalene, even she assumes, well, you, they've taken his body. Just tell me where you put it, right? In other words, you look at every single account, they don't, they don't believe he's been raised from the dead. Because guess what? Even ancient people, as primitive as they were, they knew that dead people stay dead. <laughs> it's true. And they knew that virgins don't have babies. Okay, Christianity makes really some pretty r- remarkable claims. And they were just as more remarkable 2,000 years ago as they are today. So why did anyone believe in the resurrection? <clears throat> I'll give you three reasons in, as we close out. First, number one, the empty tomb. All of our accounts, all the Gospels and, uh, no, just all the Gospels, four accounts, tell us that when they went out on Sunday morning, the tomb where they had laid his corpse was empty. Now, the the empty tomb is a necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition for the resurrection. Because tombs can get emptied in all kinds of ways, right? You can steal the body, you can move the body, you can have the wrong tomb, you know, all kinds of things. So the first, although in this case, they don't have the wrong tomb because they all went to where they buried it on Friday. It was Joseph Arimathea's personal tomb. So the tomb's empty. That's the first issue. But that's not enough for the resurrection. The second motive for believing in the resurrection is that Jesus appears to everyone in his body. Right? Like in Luke 24, he appears to the apostles 
and they think he's a ghost, and he's like, I'm not a ghost. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones. So if you're curious, you know, touch me, feel the wounds in my hands, right? And they still doubt. And so he says, got anything to eat? Give me a piece of fish. And so he eats it in front of them. That's one thing ghosts cannot do. They cannot eat fish. 